Good morning, everybody. This is Pastor Jan for Sunday service, opening with um, Psalm twenty, uh, Psalm sixty-two today. Um, that's the Psalm of the day. We are um, broadcasting again from our home. Uh, my husband will be sharing the word. I'm just doing the opening and the communion message. So make sure you have your elements, something to drink and something to eat for um, communion. So first of all, let me open in prayer. Dear God, dear Jesus, dear Lord of Lord and Prince of Prince, Lord, we just ask you today that you be with us as we minister the word and that the words we speak are your words. Lord, I just pray that um, you would bless our congregation and anybody that's watching this this broadcast, Lord, that they, their eyes would see more clearly, that their ears would hear more sharply, Lord, that their touch would be more tender, Lord, and their words would be sweetness unto other people. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. All right, so I'm going to begin reading in um, Psalm 62, and then we're going to go to Matthew, so to give you a heads up. Truly, my soul silently waits for God. From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. How long will you attack a man? You shall be slain, all of you, like a leaning wall and a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down with his high position. They delight in lies and they bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. My soul waits silently for God alone. For my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my desire. I shall not be moved. I'm sorry, he is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Surely men of low degree are a vapor, but men of high degree are a lie. If they are weighed on the scales, they are altogether lighter than vapor. Do not trust in oppression, nor vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. God has spoken once, Twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. Also to you, O Lord, belongs mercy. For you render to each one according to his work. Okay, now let's turn, before I comment on that, to Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now remember last week we talked about the birth of Jesus. And we talked about some misconceptions that have um, played into our nativity, that have played into our, our, our thoughts and feelings and views on what, what the first Christmas looked like. And all week I just kept thinking that wherever Jesus, Mary, and Joseph were, that it was jam-packed with their relatives, with Joseph's family, that they were all just dying to hold that baby and they were fussing over Mary, and they were slapping Joseph on the back. And then I wondered, did Joseph say, well, that's the son of God. He's really not my son, He's just, but I'm going to take care of him. I wondered about that. But I, that still empty stable is not what Christmas looked like. It was a celebration. It was a huge celebration. And I could just picture the laughter and the singing and the hugging and the kissing and the fighting over to hold that baby Jesus. So that was a, a, a misconception that I, I stomped out of my mind. Christmas will never look the same to me. Now we're going to look about the wise men. Um, the wise men didn't come till 12 days after. So that's why some churches celebrated on January 6th. So let's read. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born, king of the Jews? 
for we have seen a star in the east and have come to worship him. So it makes sense, right? They're going to the king. They're going to Herod, asking where's the newborn king, thinking if anybody would know it would be him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And so they said to him, Well, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, and not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. Now, you know what's really kind of interesting? Herod never bothered to see the star. He never saw the star. He never bothered to look up. It, it tells what kind of king he was. It tells what kind of person he was. There's a star in the sky, and he never saw it. He never looked up to heaven. He never saw it. But these kings, these men, and there weren't just three of them, and that's another misconception we have in our minds because three gifts were given. We assumed it was three men. It were, But it could have been 30 for all we know. We don't know how many, but it was probably more than three. So anyway, just another misconception we have. And I think it's really kind of interesting that he met with them secretly. And then he sent, sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. And when they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You know, I think it's interesting now she's in a house. I think it's interesting that um, she's not in that smelly, stinky room anymore. But she's in a house. And... Um, and, and I just came thinking of Mary just being so overwhelmed by all this activity about the joy and the gifts and the laughter and the celebration. Um, then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Again, we, we see that dreams are used. Joseph had many dreams. Joseph will have another dream. Uh, the Lord spoke to them through dreams nowadays. We have the Holy Spirit who speaks to us, although you can still hear the Lord, Lord's voice in dreams. Um, now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt, and, the, and was there until the death of Herod, which it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. And then Herod, when he saw this, saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he set forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all of its districts from two years old under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Now that story reminds me of Moses, of Moses the great deliverer, Moses who was hidden in the bulrushes because there was an edict to, to kill all young boys under the age, I think it was two. two. And so um, we see another, a, a similarity there that, that the enemy seeks to destroy, kill, destroy his people, God's people, from completing their destiny. So let's go back to 62. And I just wanted, it must have been in another um, version I was reading on this, is that the implication is that, you know, David is being 
uh, sought after. Absalom wants to kill him. Before that, Saul wanted to kill him. And can you imagine people just wanting to kill you? Can you imagine running, hiding, that feeling that um, you don't know where to turn, you don't know what to do, that there are people that want you dead? Well, then I thought of Jesus. He's 12 days old, 12 days old and already. There's an edict out for more than 12 days, but not much to kill him, to kill him. We don't even know how many other conspiracy theories were going on at that time to have him killed. But we do know, we do know at the end of his life, he was killed. The devil was rejoicing, but it was really God. It, the, the devil was fulfilling God's plan. But I would imagine all of Jesus' life, he knew he was in danger. And then it made me think about Mary and Joseph. When Mary said, yes, I'll do it, did she really figure out the whole implication of that? Her and Joseph were going to take care of him, watch out for him, make sure no danger came to him. And I think about the story when he was 12 and he went uh, for his bar mitzvah and they lost him. Can you imagine the panic? Was he kidnapped? Was he killed? What happened to him? There's so many things um, that probably went through their mind that we don't even realize. But when we go back to Psalm 62 and we read it, apply to Jesus, apply to yourself, apply it to David. So let me read it one more time. Truly my soul silently waits for God. Can we say that? When we're in trouble, Maybe, no, it's not that someone's trying to kill us, but maybe we feel like we're dead. Do we wait for God? From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. How long will you attack a man, devil? You shall be slain, all of you, like a leaning wall and a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his high position. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. My soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in him. You know, I know people in our congregation that are really trying to help others who are struggling. And they keep pointing that person back to Jesus. They keep pointing and saying, he is your answer. Not this, not that, not a girlfriend, not a boyfriend, not more money, not a better job. It is Jesus. And they keep pointing him back hoping that they will come out of their, their uh, ditch where they're hiding from life, from their hiding from God. It says, trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us, Selah. And I will admit, when we're in the middle of something hard, it's hard to look to him sometimes. It's hard to say, okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get upset. I'm not gonna worry. I'm gonna trust in God. I think it's hard to do sometimes, but that's what the word's telling us to do. Surely men of low degree are a vapor. Men of high degree are a lie. Wow. If they are weighed on the scales, they are altogether lighter than vapor. Do not trust in oppression, nor vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. You know, I think that's a hard one. I think it's a hard for it's a hard one for Americans. I think we we do many times count our riches as blessings from God. But yet God himself said it's 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 hard for a rich man to enter the eye of a camel. It's it's hard. Look at what happened when the young rich ruler came to him and said, what do I need to do? I've done everything. And Jesus said, give all away. And he couldn't do it. 
I think many times the riches choke us. God has spoken once, twice I've heard this. So if God repeats it, it's worth listening. The power belongs to God. Also to you, O oh Lord, belongs mercy. I think that's incredible. Our God is powerful, but more importantly, he's full of mercy. That even if I screw up, he's going to show me mercy. That's incredible. For you render to each one according to his work. I just want to say that um, I hope everyone really reflected on Jesus on Christmas. And that the gifts from other family members were insignificant compared to the birth the gift of Jesus. I really hope that um, this year, um, with the transformation of what's going on around us, we change, that we begin to start thinking about what can I give? What can I do? That we change in um, from worrying about do I have enough money? Do I have enough riches? Do I have enough to, do I do enough? Do I help enough? Do you know what I'm saying? It's an hour where um, God is really asking us to do more. He's asking us to listen. I, I'm amazed. I'm just amazed at Joseph, how obedient he was in all of this. He heard from God. He believed that dream and he left. And even when they came back, when they were leaving Egypt and coming back, Joseph didn't go where Herod was. He didn't go back to Bethlehem. He didn't go back his family. He went to Galilee. He, he went somewhere he thought would be safe. And I thought, what a remarkable man that he was so in tune to God that he made those decisions for Jesus so Jesus would be safe and could live out his life until his um, time. So I'm just going to pray now. We're going to get our elements. We're going to, I hope this didn't seem like it's all over the place. I think my point is this, is that our lives are always perpetually in danger. The fact that we're a Christian really serving God makes us an enemy of the enemy. And every every time he can, every turn he can, he would like to, to sniff, snuff us out. But we need to cry out to God and know that God is watching out for us, protecting us, guiding us, leading us. And... We are here to fulfill a mission. Each one of you has a role to play. And so cry out to him. Get on your knees and, and worship him. And I beg you to read the Psalms and the Gospels to blend um, prayers and worship with seeing Jesus in action. And you will see how they intertwine and they work together. For his glory so lord jesus thank you so much for again dying for us we're going to partake of your body lord and um again in worship we think how horrible your death was lord i don't know if any one of us would be willing to do that but lord we thank you that since you were a baby, death tried to take you away from us, Lord. That, But it was only in your time did you succumb to that awful death, Lord. But we remember you because you rose again, Lord. We remember you in glory. In Jesus' name, amen. And Lord, we thank you for the blood, your precious, precious blood.
that was shed for us worthless sinners. Help us in this day, this hour, this minute, dear God, to make right choices. To listen to your Holy Spirit guiding us. To really open our ears to hear when you speak. Jesus, help us, Lord, to be like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, bye. Good morning. <clears throat> Let me get ready here. Well, it has really uh, been a time for me, very difficult time, just feeling really the weight, the weight of uh, this year, this season, this time in history that's upon us all. It's struck me particularly hard, just feeling the burden for the nation, for the church, political division, civil anger and pain, the coronavirus, and I think the missing uh, of the Thanksgiving Christmas holidays just wasn't the same this year. Um, and really feeling, really even struggling, struggling with um, the word this morning. I mean, I've been in the Psalms. We've all been in the Psalms. We've been teaching the Psalms. We've been looking at the prophetic dimension of the Psalms, how there's a plan in the Psalms, even as they are arranged terms of how God works out his purposes in, in, in human history, but even studying over the Psalms, I, I really want to look at Psalm 52 through 59, if possible today. Looking at them last night, awakened in the middle of the night, 3 a.m. reading them, just not feeling anything there. And, uh, Finally, again, I just said, I don't even know that I have anything. But uh, I looked over them again, probably about 9.30 this morning. And I started reading them and they started resonating because I realized that I'm not just reading these Psalms, I'm in these Psalms. You know, we're in this second Davidic Psalter, which runs from Psalms 51 through 65, which are all titled Psalms of David. It's a second Davidic Psalter because in book one, Psalms one through 41, 38 of those are written by David. We uh, had a number of Psalms written by the sons of Korah as we started book two in Psalm 42, the Exodus book. And last week we looked at 50 and 51. Psalm 50 is one of the Psalms of Asaph. It's a powerfully prophetic Psalm, and we saw that as just a, a, a real picture of where we're at now in the church, in the earth, in our nation, coming into the throne room of God's judgment and the Lord separating between the godly ones, those who are the chesed ones, those who trust in his steadfast love from the wicked ones, those who have his word speak his word, but don't live his word. And yet the Lord calling both into his steadfast love. And then we saw that transition into Psalm 51, which is, of course, a psalm of repentance. It's David's psalm of repentance for his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah, adultery, murder. And it is the Lord calling David through the prophet Nathan into repentance, the very repentance that Psalm 50 prophesied that is necessary for God's people in this 
hour. Now, Psalm 51 then begins this stretch of, of 15 psalms that run from 51 through 65, all about David's repentance, about David's kingship, about, as Jan said, David's being pursued constantly by his enemies. The, the same danger that Moses faced, the same danger that David faced, the same danger that Jesus faced. It's the same danger that we face as we go through our exodus, our journey from oppression, the oppression of Egypt, into freedom, into the land, into our inheritance. It's a, it's a picture. And as Jan accurately pointed out with Psalm 62, which remember is part of this these 15 Psalms of David. There's danger in the Christian life. Now, these Psalms are not in chronological order. Psalm 51 is about David and Bathsheba, which is uh, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11 and chapter 12. Uh, that's when David's already in his kingship. Then, then he begins to move in these next psalms to before his kingship. Uh, between the time when God was putting down Saul, removing him from the kingship, and establishing David as king. And Saul, of course, is not happy with David becoming the king. Um, Saul is after David. And we we see more events in the life of David, including some even further out of place, uh, out of chronological order, but it's the it's the it's a theological order, it's a message. And so the David who repents in Psalm 51 begins a series of psalms of those who opposed his kingship, those who opposed him becoming the king, those who opposed him when he was king. And Psalm 52, the superscription says, to the choir master, a maskil of David when Doeg the Edomite came and told Saul, David has come to the house of Ahimelech. Uh, we, we, we see uh, events now taking place in David's life. And what, what the, I want to um, take a look at these uh, and at least point out to you uh, where in David's life these particular uh, psalms took place from. So let me uh, locate my uh, book of psalms here on my cell phone because my book of psalms has... Uh, has listed where all these particular psalms took place. So this, this first one has to do with betrayal. We're going to see a lot of betrayal. Betrayal is the common theme here uh, in these psalms 52 through 59. This comes from 1 Samuel 21. And David is betrayed by Doeg the Edomite. David is on the run from Saul, and he comes in to the town of Nob. This would be in 1 Samuel 21 and 1 Samuel 22. We're not going to look at that. Some of these we will look at, but I'll summarize it. And David goes to the priests, and he looks for food. He gets Goliath's sword. The priests just think, well, David is Saul's son-in-law. I mean, he's just here on working for the king, and they assist David in his journey. Well, Doeg, an Edomite, descendant of Esau, the brother of Jacob, he's, a, he's related to the Jewish people, uh, but he sides with Saul, and he betrays David, and he says David was there, and the priests help, helped him. And this is why Psalm 52, 1 starts out with, Why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? The steadfast love of God endures all day. Now, remember, we're, we're recognizing how the steadfast love is one of the key attributes of Yahweh, the key attributes of 
David's God that sustains David through all of his trials, through all of his struggles, through all of the violence, through all of the betrayal. This is again a betrayal of David by a mighty man. And this particular mighty man is contrasted. He's, he's boasting in evil while God's steadfast love is there to cause David to endure. So Doeg betrays him. Saul comes and says to the priests, what, I'm after David. Why, why did you help him? They're like, well, he's your son-in-law. We didn't know you were after him. And Saul has all the priests murdered. He has a city of priests put to death because they, quote unquote, helped David. And again, these are burdens that David has to bear. He was betrayed by Doeg, and yet inadvertently, the priests helping David, helping the man of God, helping the, the man that God has chosen to put in as king now, are put to death. And so this, this psalm is a lament. Again, many of these psalms are laments of David. But David mentions in this psalm three times the steadfast love of God. In verse 1, which we read, also in verse 8, verse 8 says, but I am like a green olive tree. Doeg is an evil man, but I am a green olive tree in the house of God. He, he's planted in the house of God as an olive tree, bearing witness to the faithfulness of God that brings fruitfulness of purpose into David's life. To see himself as an olive tree uh, while he's, his, he's being pursued to be put to death is a statement of faith in the midst of lament. And it's because he trusts in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you forever because you, Lord, have done it. In the time of heavy weight right now, we have to trust in the steadfast love of God that the promises of God, he will do it. Sometimes it just seems the promises of God are just not going to be fulfilled. It's like, well, all these things that God has said he's going to do, all these promises, all these wonderful things, and look at everything that's happening. Our, our, our nation is in disarray. The church is in division. But David still trusts in the steadfast love of God. I will thank you forever because you have done it. I will wait for your name, for it is good in the presence of the godly, the chesed ones, the ones who trust in his steadfast love. So the betrayal of Doeg, the Edomite, um, is countered by God's steadfast love. Betrayal will be countered by the steadfast love of God. Psalm 53, another lament. It's to the choir master. The superscription says at the start of the psalm, to the choir master, to him who grants the victory. That's what choir master means in Hebrew. And while it's a, it's a term given to the person who's going to put this psalm to music and sing it, it also is a reference to the ultimate choir master, the Lord. Yahweh is the ultimate choir master. David is trusting in his choir master to cause the, the musical to uh, take place the way it was set up to take place. Start, middle, finish. To the choir master, according to Mahalath, a maskil of David. Now again, a maskil of David uh, is a, uh, the previous psalm was a maskil. A maskil is a song or a psalm that teaches wisdom. But it's also to mahalath, and mahalath means sickness. It means illness. It's, 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 it's a psalm that represents the illness that is at work attempting to hinder David. Now, there's betrayal from people like Doeg, and there will be illness that comes from, as the first verse says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. There will be illness that comes from fools that seek to hinder the purposes of God from taking place in David's life, in the church's life, in our lives. Now, I've talked about this before. There are three words for fool in the book of Proverbs. There's a foolish fool, 
there's a there's a, a a fool who who causes hurt and brings hurt, and then there's a dangerous fool. Now, the dangerous fool in Hebrew is the naval, and this is the naval, the fool. The naval is the most dangerous of all fools. The lowest level of fool is just someone who's simple, someone who's foolish, someone who, because he's human, does human things that are against God, sin, foolishness. The second kind of fool is a fool who is driven by his own pain. And a fool driven by his own pain causes pain to others. Now that fool is somewhat dangerous, somewhat harmful, hurtful. But but that fool is a fool because of his or her own pain. The naval is the one who is against God, against anything that is of God, against the purposes of God, who actively and intentionally finds pleasure in opposing God. An evil man, a dangerous fool. Not a useful fool, a dangerous fool. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable iniquity. There is none who does good. Fools, this kind of fool does not do good. God looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. This kind of fool does not understand, does not seek after God, does not do good. They have all fallen away. These are apostates. These are people who have fallen away from the Lord, from God, from his purposes. They have all fallen away. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, no, not one. Have those who work evil no knowledge, who eat my people as they eat bread and do not call on God? And see, they see human beings, particularly God's people, as food for their belly. They are there in great terror where there is no terror. See, there's a turning. The Lord says, though, but, but I'm going to terrorize those who terrorize my people. For God scatters the bones of him who encamps against you. You put them to shame, for God has rejected them. The Lord, just as he will intervene with his steadfast love against betrayal, will enter with his mighty heavenly warrior perspective, actions and deeds against these dangerous fools who seek to destroy God, God's kingdom, God's purposes in the earth. To be put to shame, remember, means to not fulfill your purpose or your destiny. He's going to stop fools from working out their purposes in the earth. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When God restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. So David sees betrayal and he sees the danger of fools, but he recognizes that the Lord is going to fulfill his purposes. The Lord is going to cause the fortunes of Israel to take place. Psalm 54, again, to the choir master with string instruments, another masculine of David, when the Ziphites went and told Saul, is David hiding among us? This particular time in David's life is 1 Samuel 23. Again, Saul is pursuing him. He's betrayed by a man in Psalm 52. He's now betrayed by a whole city, a whole tribe, a group of people in Psalm 54. Everywhere David goes, it just seems more and more everyone is against him. In Psalm 54, we see some, see, we remember this is the Eloistic Psalter. It starts with Psalm 42 and actually goes into the third book, into the 80 Psalms, uh, where um, the name Yahweh is not used too much and primarily Elohim is used. Elohim, he's God of all the earth. Yahweh, he's God of his people. He's Yahweh Elohim to his people, the God of all the earth who renders justice in all the earth, but is also the special covenant God, the father of his people. And in Psalm 51, 52, and 53, we don't see the name Yahweh mentioned. In fact, we don't see Yahweh mentioned much at all 
uh, in this, um, this particular section of Davidic Psalms, but we see the name Yahweh mentioned again in the sixth verse. Verse four says, Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. He will return the evil to my enemies. In your faithfulness, put an end to them. With a free will offering, I will sacrifice you. My people will be free will offerings in the day of your power. See, it's out of being pursued by fools, which, of course, that fool may be Saul, the one who's pursuing David and going against God's purposes, even though at one time he was a man of God. Psalm 52, betrayal. Psalm 54, betrayal. But it is out of betrayal that the Lord demonstrates his power and God's people become free will offerings in the day of his power. So as we're pursued right now by betrayal, by foolishness, by the division in the body of Christ, by this, this coronavirus, by just, just all kinds of political haranguing. As we're being pursued and our spirits are down, may we look to the steadfast love of the Lord and recognize that God will make us willing in the day of his power. And the day of his power is when he puts his enemies down and establishes his kingdom purposes by fulfilling his promises to us. I will give thanks to your name, Yahweh, for it is good. The name Yahweh is mentioned. And again, the Lord reveals himself as special covenant God in the midst of these series of murderous, violent hindrances that come against David becoming who God has called him to be. For he has delivered me from every trouble. My eye has looked in triumph on my enemies. Now, Psalm 55 is very interesting. I want to spend a little bit of time in Psalm 55. Psalm 55 is not designated a specific uh, time in David's life, but I think there are clues in Psalm 55 that will help us and help us significantly to understand David now does something. David begins to give voice to those who have no voice. As he is betrayed, as he is, is punished by fools, as he repents uh, in terms of his sin with Bathsheba, he's dealing with his himself, his own heart. He's dealing with outward enemies. He's dealing with danger. He's dealing with murder. He's dealing with violence. Betrayed by the the king who is his father-in-law, betrayed by individuals, mighty men, mighty warriors, betrayed by a whole city. And, and seeing devastation take place, violence in the wake of, of his betrayal, a whole city of priests put to death by Saul. David begins to say, give ear to my prayer, O God. 55.1, hide not yourself from my plea for mercy, my supplication for grace. I need your grace, Lord. Attend to me and answer me. I'm restless in my complaint and I moan because of the noise of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked. For they drop trouble on me and in anger they bear a grudge against me. The lament, the pressures are beginning to get to David. And it, it, it appears that David is speaking for himself at this moment. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me and horror overwhelms me. And then we have these moments. I, I, I was, I've been having this moment these past few days. It's just the weight, the burden has been so heavy upon me. And we get moments like this, we say, I say to myself, oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. Yes, I would wander far away. I would lodge in the wilderness, Selah. I would hurry to find a shelter from the raging wind and tempest. I'm going to go into the wilderness. I'm going to get away from all the wilderness, which is normally a place of danger, a place of solitude for David under all the things that he's going through, it becomes a place of refuge. And how often do we feel this way? 
and he's beginning to give voice to not just his own cries, but to the cries of the oppressed, the cries of the vulnerable, the cries of the broken. And see, this is so important in the midst of our own sufferings. And we can make our own suffering everything. We can build an altar to our own pain, in which case we become like that second category of fool, the one who hurts others because he himself is hurt. Hurt people hurt others. Wounded people wound others. But true prophetic spirit brings us in the solidarity with those who are suffering. When we suffer, we are to turn and look at those who their regular life is suffering and enter into a solidarity with them. This is a, an aspect of the real spirit of prophecy that I see missing from so many so-called prophets and their prophetic words, so many Christian teachers and their teaching of the word of God. They, there's a lack of empathy with other people, a lack of solidarity. If you really are moving in the spirit of prophecy, you not only empathize, and by empathize, that's not sympathize. Empathize means God supernaturally transports us into the very shoes of other people who are suffering, whose regular lot in life is to suffer. We suffer once in a while, but now we're talking about people who, are, who live under oppressive suffering. And that's empathy, and it puts you there, and it not only causes you to understand what they understand, to see the world from their perspective, but you begin to enter into a solidarity. Now, at this point, David begins to speak beyond himself. He speaks for those, the vulnerable, who are oppressed. And this is important language. Destroy, O Lord, divide their tongues. Now, these are the oppressors. He's speaking to those who oppress God's people. Destroy, O Lord, divide their tongues. I see violence and strife in the city. The word for violence is Hamas. It's a common Hebrew word. And the interesting thing about the use of Hamas in Psalms, and it's, it's, it's many times in Psalms, it is violence that utilizes the law to render oppression on people who are vulnerable, who are throwaways, who have no rights, who have no strength, who have no ability to fight against this. It's a word that, that talks about the powerful using even just laws, righteous laws, to render violence against the poor and against the oppressed. And this is important. The true spirit of prophecy recognizes abuse of power, and it recognizes abuse of power among the poor, over the poor, in the poor. In fact, the second word where it says, I see violence and strife is the Hebrew word reeve. Lawsuits, legal terminology. I see the violence that utilizes legality to steal, to kill, and to destroy those who are unable to defend themselves. This is why David begins to give voice to these people and says, destroy, O Lord, divide the tongues, separate the power that the powerful are using, the law to oppress the vulnerable. For I see violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go around it on its walls. Iniquity and trouble are in it. Iniquity is the Hebrew word, the devastation that is caused from sin. Trouble is within it. Ruin is in its midst. Corruption is in its midst. Oppression and fraud do not depart from the marketplace. And then as he's beginning to give voice, David begins to give voice to an individual. It's in the plural right there. He's giving voice to a category, a group of people, but then he goes to the singular, the first person. For it is not an enemy who taunts me, 
then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me, then I could hide from him. But is it is you, a human being, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. The, the, the terminology is very significant. It's the Hebrew word enosh for man, which is man in his weakness, man in his depravity man in his sinfulness, man in his inability to do what, what is right. This person has that, that David is giving voice to has been betrayed by a weak person. But that person is described as an equal. It's a peer. It's not now the powerful oppressing the poor. This is a peer, peer oppression. My companion, my intimate, someone I'm very, very close to. My familiar friend, an acquaintance that I spend a lot of time with. It goes further. We used to take sweet counsel together. It's talking about sharing secrets with each other. Within God's house, we walked with the crowd. We used to go together into the house of the Lord and worship the Lord and celebrate the Lord what a picture. And then again, we go back to the plural. David goes from this individual back to this, this group that he's identifying with. Let them, that death steal over them. Let them go down a shale alive for evil is in their dwelling place and in their heart. He's now identifying again with the oppressed and he's crying out for God to judge the oppressors. But I call to God and the Lord will save me. Back to the singular, giving voice to somebody who doesn't have a voice. Evening and morning and at noon, I utter my complaint and I moan and the Lord hears my voice. He, he hears my voice, but it's referring to God. This person who is oppressed, who was betrayed by someone close to him or her, crying out to God. He hears my voice. He redeems my soul in safety from the battle that I wage, from the many arrayed against me. God will give ear and humble them. Now let me say this, the intention of the Lord in this hour, it's not to destroy oppressors, it's to humble oppressors to bring them into repentance. We're gonna see that in the final three Psalms we look at this morning, but keep that in mind where David has this severe cry, judge them, this individual that David is giving a voice says, humble them. He who is enthroned of old, Selah. Now, there, it's unusual to have a Selah in the middle of a verse, but it's, it's speaking to the Lord who is established in his kingship and his lordship. The one who is enthroned from of old, will give ear and humble them. And then it says, because they do not change, they do not fear God. To change, to repent, to be transformed, to not come to a place in your walk with Christ and say, I've attained, don't have to go forth any further. I've told my church over and over, the thing that scares me the most about some people in the Lord is they get to a certain place and that's it. They can't learn anything more. It's the same old tired doctrines, the same old tired articulations, the same old uh, 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 tired perspectives. Not that any of those are untrue, but we are called by God to change. We're called to be transformed by betrayal, by violence, by suffering. We're called to change. Those who do not change do not fear God. Now, some translations say, because they do not change and do not fear God, it's, it's, it's up in the air from the Hebrew whether those who don't change don't change because they don't fear God or they don't change and they don't fear God. But the key is, the fear of the Lord. When God comes to humble a church, an individual, a people group, a nation, when God comes to humble them, he comes to bring change and transformation through the fear of the Lord. If we're not willing in this hour to 
have the hand of God change us, transform us in the fear of the Lord, we may find ourselves as a naval, a fool. My companion, and now this person who has this voice goes back to the companion. My companion stretched out his hand against his friends. He violated the covenant. His speech was smooth as butter, yet war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. What is, what situation is David speaking about in his life? Well, in, in, in the my commentary to the Psalms, Hermeneia commentary by Hosfeld and Zenger, Hosfeld says this about this individual who is crying out about betrayal by a companion, an equal, a familiar friend, one whose uh, words were as smooth as butter, but war was in his heart. It's about a person who's been violated. And Hosfeld makes reference to a, an article by Ulrike Bail, and she interpreted the individual in Psalm 55, the one who said, and she said, many individuals, many women who experience rape feel like this. Oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. Yes, I would wander far away. I would lodge in the wilderness. That the language that's being described here is the language of a woman who has suffered a rape. David is giving voice to someone. In 2 Samuel chapter 13, David's daughter, Tamar, was raped by David's son, Amnon. And David didn't handle it well. We'll we'll look at it briefly. 2 Samuel 13. And it's as if David, being oppressed by his enemies, feeling this solidarity with those who've been violated, having prophetic empathy, remembers his daughter Tamar, who was violated. Now, the disappointment of betrayal by one's closest friend, Hosfeld says, has parallels in Jeremiah chapter 20, where Jeremiah, he, Jeremiah was betrayed by so many people. Finally, he says, Lord, you betrayed me. It has parallels with Job. The whole book of Job is Job's fighting with God that God has betrayed him. Urike Bail is cited by Hosfeld. She says, if we read Psalm 55 in an attempt to understand the experiences of raped women, something astonishing emerges. Not only the emotional, psychic consequences of rape, the the consequences upon the, the disparagement of one's own soul, violation of one's own soul, Not only the emotional consequences of rape, such as depression, hopelessness, lack of self-esteem, and damage to one's identity correspond to what is being described in Psalm 55. Besides these, the image of a person close to the woman who ended up raping her is found among most rape victims. Most rape victims are raped by someone close to them. Turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 13. When we talk about a real spirit of prophetic empathy, We talk about entering into the pain and the sorrows of others, identifying with it, being in solidarity with it, and then becoming a redemptive instrument of God to help that person heal and get well. Jesus, Isaiah 53, a man of sorrows, 
acquainted with grief. Do you think Jesus didn't understand what was going on with the, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the, the enemies of God, the poor, the oppressed? Why do you think they gathered around with him? He was ministering to them out of a solidarity with their pain, a solidarity that was foreshadowing the ultimate solidarity that he would enter into on the cross. 2 Samuel 13 says this, Now Absalom, David's son, had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar. And after a time, Amnon, David's son, loved her. And Amnon was so tormented that he made himself ill because of his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin, and it seemed impossible to Amnon to do anything to her. Now remember, David had multiple wives. So Amnon, Tamar, and Absalom had the same father, David, but different mothers. Now, actually, a, a, a half-brother there could marry his sister. Amnon is the half-brother of Tamar. Absalom and Tamar are full siblings because they have the same mother and the same father. Amnon begins to desire Tamar. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimeah, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very crafty man, another relative. And he said to him, O oh, son of the king, why are you so haggard morning after morning? Will you not tell me? Amnon said to him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Jonadab said to him, lie down on your bed and pretend to be ill. And when your father comes to see you, say to him, let my sister Tamar come and give me bread to eat and prepare the food in my sight that I may see it and eat it from her hand. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. And when the king came to him, Amnon said to the king, saying to his father, David, please let my sister Tamar come and make a couple of cakes in my sight that I may eat from her hand. Again, David is kind of an unwitting participant, just as he was with the priests in Nob that Saul would end up slaying. He's a useful idiot here, okay? David's a useful idiot. He should have known better. These are his children. So David sent home to Tamar saying, go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house where he was lying down and she took dough and kneaded it and made cakes in his sight and baked the cakes. And she took the pan and emptied it out before him, but he refused to eat. And Amnon said, send out everyone from me. So everyone went out from him and Amnon said to Tamar, Tamar, bring the food into the chamber that I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the cakes she had made and brought them into the chamber, the chamber to Amnon, her brother. Re remember the words. Remember the words in the psalm. For it's not an enemy who taunts me. Then I could bear it. This, these are Tamar's words. David is giving expression to his daughter's pain and sorrow as he looks back at the devastation that took place. It's not an adversary who deals insolent with me. Then I could hide from him, but it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. We used to take sweet counsel together within God's house. We walked in the crowd. And Tamar took the cakes she had made and brought them into the chamber to Amnon, her brother. But when she brought them near him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, come lie with me, my sister. She answered, no, my brother, do not violate me for such a thing is not done in Israel. Do not do this outrageous thing. As for me, where could I carry my shame? And as for you, you would be one of the outrageous fools in Israel, the Navals of Israel. Was David's inspiration for the 53, 53rd Psalm about the fools and the betrayal of fools and the harm that fools do? Was it his son who was the inspiration for that? 
as for me, where would I carry my shame? I repeat, and as for you, you would be as one of the outrageous fools in Israel. Now, therefore, speak to the king, for he will with not he will not withhold me from you. If you want to do this, do this right. Ask for my hand. But he would not listen to her, and being stronger than she, he raped her. He violated her and lay with her. Then Amnon hated her with very great hatred. See, he wasn't driven by love. He wasn't driven. He was driven by hatred, violence. It's where, where people say that, that rape is not primarily a sexual act. It's an act of violence. It's an act of oppression. It's an act of using power to manipulate the soul of the powerless to give you what you want. Amon hated her with very great hatred so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, get up, go. But she said to him, no, my brother, for this is wrong and, and sending me away is greater than the other thing you did to me. But he would not listen to her. A non-virgin was not marriage qualified in Israel. He called the young man who served him, put this woman out of my presence, bolt the door after her. Now she was wearing a long robe with sleeves, for thus were the virgin daughters of the king dressed. She goes in a virgin, she leaves only with the cloak of virginity. So his servant put her out and bolted the door after her, and Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the long robe that she wore. And she laid her hand on her head and went away, crying aloud as she went. And her brother Absalom said to her, Has Amnon, your brother, been with you? Now hold your peace, my sister. He is your brother. Do not take this to heart. Absalom acts like he's, uh, don't, don't worry about it. Amnon's your brother. Amnon's your brother, that is. You know, just don't say anything. But Absalom is plotting vengeance. So Tamar lived a desolate woman in her brother Absalom's house. She was no longer a virgin. Whole different situation then than it is now. Even worse now. Worse then. It's worse now for the psychological reasons. Worse then for the reality of life. She was damaged goods. When King David heard of all these things, he was very angry. He, David gets angry, and what does he do? Nothing. <laughs> what is getting angry? The wrath of man does not fulfill the righteousness of God. But Absalom spoke to Amnon, neither good nor bad, for Absalom hated Amnon because he had violated his sister Tamar. Back to Psalm 55. We know what happens Absalom ends up murdering Amnon and turning against his father David and removing David from the kingship, rebelling against David, throwing David out of the kingship and seeking a coup d'etat, seeking to take over the country, all because of one man's violent actions. And of course, David loves his children and he loves Absalom. And then Absalom, of course, is put to death. So in Psalm 55, David is saying, basically, I'm going to give voice to my daughter Tamar. I didn't do it then. And the effects were devastating on my entire family, my entire kingship. David is betrayed by not just his family, he's betrayed by his own soul again. This happens after the event of David and Bathsheba and Uriah. You see, our betrayal can come from without and it can come from within. We can end up betraying ourselves. But at some point in time, David writes a song for his daughter Tamar and he sees the parallel between the violation of Tamar and the oppression of the poor and the vulnerable and it leads him it leads him again to God to see things more clearly. When we're back to Psalm 55, T 
Tamar says through David in verse 21 again, his speech, Amnon's, was smooth as butter, yet war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn with swords. And then Tamar, <laughs> David puts the words in her mouth, a powerful verse quoted in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, a powerful verse for Christians forever. Cast your burden on Yahweh, my personal, intimate God. Tamar cries out to him. Cast your burden on Yahweh and he will sustain you. Cast your cares on him for he cares for you. The Lord meets the violated woman. The Lord meets the violated oppressed and the Lord overturns the oppressors. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. But you, O oh God, will cast them down in the pit of destruction. Men of blood and treachery shall not live out half their days, but I will trust in you. The Navals receive the severe judgment of the Lord. Psalm 56. To the choir master, according to the dove of the far-off terebinths, a miktam of David, when the Philistines seized him in Gath. <laughs> now David, it, he betrayal of individuals, betrayal of cities, betrayal of fools, betrayal by his own family, betrayal by his own heart. One betrayal after another, and now it's betrayal of the Philistines. David is so desperate, and the events in Psalm 56, which I will just relate briefly. The events in Psalm 56 here come from 1 Samuel 21, 11, where David has to flee to the enemies of God's people. He's got no one left. And he runs into the Philistines and the Philistines say, wait a second, isn't this David? He runs to the king of the Philistines. I mean, you talk about being desperate, being so desperate from betrayal and persecution and warfare that we even turn to the enemies of God and God's people. He's going to seek refuge from the Philistines. The very Goliath was a Philistine. David's the mighty warrior who destroyed the Philistines warriors, who's made war against the Philistines. And he comes there looking for help from the king, and then the Philistines come to the king and say, that's David. What the heck is he doing here? You, this is the enemy of God's people. And David had to feign madness. He had to act like he was insane to escape. And the 10th verse, well, the first verse Psalm 56, be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me all day long and attacker oppresses me. And the final verse, verse 13, for you have delivered my soul from death. Yes, my feet from falling that I may walk before God in the light of life. And then I want to just spend the final few minutes we have. The final three Psalms, 57, 58, and 59, all have the same phrase in it. Psalm 57 is to the choir master. There's the, the, the one who gives victory to the choir master according to do not destroy is the Hebrew word. There are going to be three straight Psalms that say do not destroy. A miktam of David when he fled from Saul in the cave. And this is going to relate to, um, this is going to relate to Psalm uh, I mean, 1 Samuel 22 and 1 Samuel 24. Well, I'm summarizing here. Go with me to 1 Samuel 22, verse 1, and then we'll go to 1 Samuel 24. I'm going to find something that Eric Zenger here says about Psalm 57, which I want to read to you. A miktam, remember a miktam, it's, it's one of those unusual words. It means it's a combination of the word to have integrity and to be humbled. Mik and tom. Mik is the Hebrew word to be humbled. Tom is the Hebrew word to have integrity. Have integrity means be immersed in your devotion to the Lord. So this is going to be a psalm where David is going to speak out of God's humbling of him, how God 
made him a man of devotion to the Lord. Now, this is a miktam of David when he fled from Saul in the cave. I, I, um, I actually sent some teaching out on this earlier in the week. Let me read the teaching. The superscription reads, Do not destroy by David when he fled from Saul in the cave. In 1 Samuel 22, if you're there in 1 Samuel 22, let me get there. 1 Samuel 22, 1 and 2 says, David departed from there. This is, uh, this is right on the heels of the previous psalm. The previous psalm where David countered the Philistines uh, was in 1 Samuel 21. In 1 Samuel 22, he flees from the Philistines and he finds himself in a cave. David departed the, from there, from the Philistines, and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. This is where David begins to muster an army. He's, 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 he's being chased by Saul, he and his men, but now all these people gather to David, an army and a following, if you will. And his family first goes to him. And then it says, everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was depressed in their souls gathered to David. And he became commander over them. And there were with him about 400 men. See, David now, as you see the progression of the Psalms from 51 here to 57, David has gotten empathy with the downtrodden, the down and out, the haves versus the have-nots. Now, the have-nots are coming to David. And see, because this prophetic anointing is upon David and he begins to identify with the oppressed, to, uh, to have this empathy with the vulnerable and how they, 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 they've been violated by the powerful, now people begin to flock to him. Those in distress, those in debt, those discouraged. They all begin to come to him. And from this, David's mighty army comes forth. This is a picture of Jesus where, again, it was the poor, the widows, the orphans, the tax collectors, the publicans, all these people that were the have-nots to those in power, in Israel at the time of Christ, they all began to gather around Jesus' table. And from that there, he gathered his disciples that would turn the world over. In 1 Samuel 22, 1 and 2, David finds those who would become his mighty men as he flees from Saul to a cave. In 1 Samuel 24, David spares Saul's life in a cave while fleeing from Saul. Let's go to 1 Samuel 24. David has this affinity with caves. See, the, the, caves are, are, are dismal places. They're desolate places. They're not places where you build your dream home, but there are also hidden places, places of protection. And it is in caves that God builds his army. It was prophesied over Lord of the Harvest when we first started that we were like the cave of Adullam. Lord, may that prophecy come to pass. I don't know if it's come to pass yet. It seems like everything is hindering it from coming to pass, but may Lord of the Harvest be the cave of Adullam. Now, in Psalm 24, David spares Saul's life in a cave. The rabbis taught the expression, do not destroy, which is how Psalm 57 starts with. The rabbis taught that by this act of mercy toward his enemies, see David, Saul is in the cave relieving himself and David's men say, look, Saul doesn't know you're here. You got him. God's delivered Saul in your hands. Put him to death. And see, there's the pattern. You don't put an end to violence by more violence, okay? You put an end to violence by breaking the cycle of violence. And even David, I mean, Saul's going to the bathroom in the cave. Can't get in a more vulnerable spot than that. 
And David spots him. All he has to do is take his, his, his sword out and put Saul to death, the man who wants to murder him, the man who's pursuing him, the man who wants to destroy him. But he's also the king. He's the Lord's anointed. And even though David knows, David is called to be the anointed of the Lord. He says, I cannot do this to the anointed of the Lord. Only the Lord can do this himself. But see, David is doing something else by showing mercy to Saul. By showing mercy to Saul, David is purging the land. He's purging himself. He's purging his kingship from Saul's violent murder and treachery. And I made this point in my text teaching. Could it be that we are being called apostolically in this hour to show mercy to our human enemies and so erase their damage from the church. We need to erase the damage of violence, of anger, of division in the church, and we do it by his steadfast love, his mercy. Are we called to fill up what is lacking in the church? Colossians 1.24, and I just said I'm completely undone by this. I've, I've had many enemies of the cross whom I would not spare as David did to Saul. And I had not discerned that the heart of God is in this. Is this not how Jesus purged the land of the unclean spirit of false prophecy when he declared, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do? See, all these people want to just get, the right wants to get the left. The left wants to punish the right. Sorry, guys. All you do is you perpetrate violence with more violence. You continue it. The Lord is calling the church to rise up to something greater. It's Jesus on the cross saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. It is after this act, David becomes king as God has promised. It's when he spares Saul that the Lord opens the door for the kingship. Lord, how long is this going to go on till we have a Davidic moment where we do not destroy? Could this be the last act that we must perform before we become the apostolic church that we've been destined to become in this hour? David proved that he would not be driven by the dark spirit of violence and falsehood that drove Saul. Instead, he would trust in and be shaped by the steadfast love of the Lord. Now, while you're there in, Saul, uh, in 1 Samuel 24, let me read a couple verses from Psalm 57. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me. For with you, my soul has sought refuge. And in the shadow of your wings, I will seek refuge until the destruction has passed by. See, oh, that I had the wings of a dove, the raped woman says. But the Lord says, you do have the wings of the dove. I will hide you in the shadow of my wings. Even in the face of confronting Saul, the ultimate enemy who wants to destroy you, I will be there, says the Lord, with the shadow of my wings. I call to God most high, to God who brings it to fulfillment for me. Let him send from heaven and rescue me those who mock me, who are hostile to me. May God send may God send his steadfast love and faithfulness. David says, no, I don't want to violently gain the kingship. Let it be by your faithfulness and your steadfast love, O Lord. My soul is in the midst of lions. I must lie down among cannibals. Their teeth are spears and arrows. Their tongue is a sharp sword. Exalt yourself above the heavens, O God. Let your glory cover the earth. This is what David is saying. And this is why the Lord is saying, do not destroy. You don't have to destroy Saul to get where you need to go. I'll get you there by my steadfast love, my faithfulness, my son, my gospel, my spirit. We don't have to have a, 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 a civil war in America or the militia out there to get the right king, the right president into power. We don't need that. We have the steadfast love of the Lord, the kindness of the Lord, the shadow of the wings of the Lord. 
They have laid a net for my steps. They have bowed down my soul within me. They have dug a pit before me, but they themselves have fallen into it. My heart is fixed. It's determined, O oh God. My heart is determined. I will, what? Murder Saul? No, I will sing and play melodies. Awake my glory. See, this is the glory. Let my glory awake, says David. Awake my glory. Awake with my lyre and my harp. I will awaken the dawn. I will sing your praise among the peoples, my Lord. I will play for you among the nations. Instead of the sword, I will sing songs of praise and it will awaken the dawn, the dawn of a prophetic new day. And then this is what he sings. Instead of slaying Saul, I will sing your praises among the peoples, my Lord. I will play for you among the nations. For immense as the heavens is your steadfast love. Your steadfast love is high to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches the sky. Exalt yourself above the heavens, O God, and let your glory be over the whole earth. Now notice what happens in Psalm, uh, 1 Samuel 24. Now, 1 Samuel 24, when Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, behold, David is in the wilderness and in Gedi. And he goes down looking for David, and it says, Saul went in to relieve himself in a cave that he comes upon in verse 3. And the men of David said to him, here is the day of which the Lord said to you, behold, I will give your enemy in your hand and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. See, that's what we're always called to. Do what, what is good to you. No, do it the Lord's way. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterwards, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to the, my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went his way. Afterward, David also arose and went out of the cave and called to Saul, my Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. He, he's setting himself up to be killed by Saul. And David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of the men who say, behold, David seeks your heart? See, one of the problems with Saul, David was always trying to prove that he wasn't trying to kill Saul, but the people surrounding Saul spoke false prophecies to Saul about David. They were lies, and Saul listened to the false prophecies. Whether it's a president surrounded by quote-unquote Christians who are speaking prophetic words to him, whether it's a pastor being spoken to by a quote-unquote prophet, whether the national prophets get uh, on, on, on the internet and spew out their false prophecies. See, false prophecy is damaging. David said, why do you listen to the words of the men who say, behold, David seeks your harm? Behold this day, your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. And I said, I will not put out my hand against the Lord for he is the Lord's anointed. See my father, see the corner of your robe, the hem of your robe in my hand. For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe, the hem of your robe, and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is in me no wrong or treason in my hands. Hebrew point. The Hebrew word for the hem of his robe that, was, that David cut off is the same Hebrew word for the shadow of his wings. God's wings, the hem of God's wings were protecting David and David cut the hem off of Saul's robe to show him that he trusted in the Lord and he was not trying to destroy the king. Powerful imagery, powerful imagery. But there's more. 
he goes on and he says, I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancients said, out of the wicked comes wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. And whom has the king of Israel come out after? And after whom do you pursue? After a dead dog, after a flea. May the Lord therefore judge and give a judicial decision between me and you and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from my hands. As soon as David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. He said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And you have declared this day how you have dealt well with me, in that you should, did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? So may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done this day. And now, behold, I know you shall surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Saul would not believe that the Lord had stolen the kingship from Saul and given it to David. He believed David was the one who had stolen the kingship from him. But when he saw the righteousness of David, Saul wept. And even though Saul would turn against David again and end up being judged by the Lord and die, something about the hem of the garment being torn from Saul's mantle caused him to see in David's righteousness that God had truly taken the kingdom from him. Go back to 1 Samuel 15. When the kingship, when the Lord rejected Saul, when the Lord had first rejected Saul, Samuel prophesied that the Lord was going to take the kingdom from Saul and give it to someone who is worthy. And this is what Saul said to Samuel. Please pardon me, 1 Samuel 15, 25, after Samuel had prophesied that Saul was going to lose the kingship. Saul wants Samuel to change the prophecy. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may bow before the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you for you have rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. The most dangerous thing we can do, brethren, is reject the word of the Lord. As Samuel turned to go away, Saul seized the hem of Samuel's robe and tore it off. As Saul was begging Samuel to let him be the king, he ripped a portion of Samuel's robe off. Oh, sounds familiar. David cut a portion of Saul's robe off. And Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And when Saul saw that David had cut the hem of his garment and instead of killing him, he remembered that when he had torn the hem from Samuel's robe, it signaled the end of his kingship. This is why Saul knew, David, you're the man. Let me close. I only have a couple minutes and I don't have time to do justice to, and that's a key word, justice to Psalm 58 and 59. But let me point this out to you. 58 says, do not destroy. 59 says, do not destroy. Just like 57. 57 is, we are not called to destroy the enemies of the Lord. What is do not destroy in 58? Psalm 58, one says, and here's where justice begins to come into play in the picture. This David who has heard the cries of the oppressed, 
who has spared those who have not spared him, who has shown mercy, who has found the Lord's steadfast love in the midst of all betrayal and all persecution and all pursuit to destroy David's life. As he has found the steadfast love of the Lord, he begins to understand and identify with justice. Psalm 58, one, what is it that's called do not destroy? Don't destroy our enemies. Do not destroy justice is the 58th Psalm. We'll talk more about this when we talk about what real kingship is about in Israel, what real leadership should look like in the world today, in the United States and the nations of the earth. It's a biblical leadership. It is rooted in, number one, first and foremost, real leadership is has to do with the word of God. It's the leadership of Deuteronomy 17, a king immersing himself in God's word. Number two, real leadership is 1 Samuel 12, where Samuel shows accountability in his leadership. He's the prophet and judge over all of Israel. He was the, the supreme ruler of Israel. A prophet was leading Israel before king was leading Israel, before Saul became the first king. But he shows complete accountability. First Samuel 12. And third, justice. And we, we've seen justice throughout the Psalms, the justice of Proverbs 31, the justice of Jeremiah 22, the justice of Micah 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love God's steadfast love and to walk humbly with your God. The kingship, the kingship, the leadership that judges all the nations of the earth, that judged Israel and that judges the church and that judges all the nations of the earth are those standards, the standards of the word of God. What's right in the word of God is right. What's wrong according to the word of God is wrong. Second, it's accountable. And third, it's justice. And so what are we not to destroy in this next Psalm? David's identification says, do you indeed decree what is right, you gods? Do you judge the children of man uprightly? No, in your heart you devise wrong and your hands deal out, there it is again, violence, Hamas in the earth. Do not destroy our enemies. We're to show them mercy. Do not destroy justice, you kings of the earth. And finally, in 59, to the choir master, according to do not destroy a miktam of David when Saul set men to watch his house in order to kill him. This is before David fled. It's, and this is my closing. It's in 1 Samuel 19. The Lord, uh, Saul sent his men to wait for David in the night and then kill him. And the third Psalm is the Lord says, and do not destroy my anointed. So the, the final themes here is we're not going to destroy our enemies. That's on our part. God will take care of our enemies on his part. That's 57 and 59. And we cannot destroy justice in the earth. Way more on that in the future. Father, we come before your throne in the name of Jesus. Thank you this day, Lord. I was discouraged going into this day. But in my discouragement, Lord, I'm finding, Lord, you're putting me in these psalms. You're trying to stretch the inner wineskins of my heart to understand the vulnerable, the oppressed, the victims of violence, the victims of power abuse, Lord. And we see power abuse everywhere in this nation and the nations of the earth, Lord. P abuse of power is nothing new. But Lord, you call your prophetic and apostolic people to rise up, the prophetic people to bear witness to the abuse of power and your apostolic people to bring the balm of Gilead to those who are oppressed and participate in their healing as we point them to their Lord and their King and their Messiah. Grant it to us, Father, in Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. 
God bless you, brethren. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.